everyone would come to me when they had questions about Islam. They would come to me when they had doubts about Islam. I would dispel people's doubts and deal with them. That's how strong my faith was. So when I eventually left Islam, you know, people, my, my friends or my former friends just genuinely kind of came up to me and said, but how could it be you of all of us? My name is Sahil. Um, I'm an ex-Muslim. I study maths at university because I'm a nerd. The reason why I took Islam so seriously is because my parents were, I mean, originally they were just your bog standard kind of Muslim. And um, what they then, I mean, when I was about six years old, they decided to become Salafis because they met a family who was living in the same tower block as, as we were, who introduced them to Salafi Islam. And just by chance, there was a, a mosque being built right next to where we were by Saudi, by, with Saudi money, um, a, a Salafi mosque. So, um, yeah, it was definitely the upbringing that I had from my parents, um, the whole Salafi kind of upbringing. And that's why I took it so seriously. The Salafi manhaj, it, it, I mean, just simply because it was what my parents brought me up with, but also it just kind of made sense. It was, you read the Quran yourself, you take it literally, you read the hadith, you look at the evidences that really appealed to me because I, I'm always someone who's looking for evidence. I was always into science and, and um, I'd, I'd consider myself to be um, interested in how things work and I always look for evidence. And this was something where I could have a, an Islamic opinion and I could bring up the evidence for it. And because of that, that just attracted me to Salafi Islam. In terms of my practicing, I mean, I would be like reading up on Islam and Islamic books all the time. Um, I would be, you know, I was trying to memorize the Quran. I don't have very strong memorizing. Uh, I'm not very good at memorizing things, but um, I memorized all of Surah Baqarah um, and Juz Amma, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't do more than that. Um, but I would, I would be reading the Quran. I would be studying Islam. Um, I, I, I. In college, I'd, I'd, I'd be in the Islamic society all the time, praying five times a day, you know, never missed a prayer. Um, you know, um, that, I feel like that wasted so much of my time, the whole praying and doing wudu before it. And I feel like such a big part of my life just got wasted. But um, yeah, that was, that was a big part of my life, Islam. It colored everything I, I understood about the world. Um, and you know, it's, in, interestingly, it's, um, you know, when I was in college, everyone would come to me when they had questions about Islam. They would come to me when they had doubts about Islam. I would dispel people's doubts and deal with them. That's how strong my faith was. So when I eventually left Islam, you know, people, my, my friends or my former friends just genuinely kind of came up to me and said, but how could it be you of all of us who left Islam? Because out of all of us, you were the most, the strongest believer of all of us. Um, and honestly, to this day, I'm not entirely sure I can fully explain how I eventually left Islam because my faith was just so strong. I was just sure Islam was true. You know, the whole sweetness of Iman and, and I experienced that. It, 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 it was a real thing for me. So, yeah, it, in terms of kind of me being Salafi and being Muslim, it, I was genuinely a proper, you know, uh, believing, practicing Muslim. I wasn't your kind of, you know, you know, a lot of Muslims will come out with, you weren't a proper Muslim to begin with. Islam was my life. And that's not an over-exaggeration. Um, yeah. What drew me to it and what made me, I mean, when I was eight years old, I read the, the verse that says something like, it's referring to the, um, the, the mushrikeen that are, are, are during the time of the prophet. And it says, all you're doing is that you're believing in the religion of your forefathers. And I thought to myself, isn't that exactly what I'm doing? Um, aren't I just following 
the religion of my forefathers. And uh, I guess when I was around eight years old, I became an ex-Muslim for a really short time. Um, up until my dad introduced me to the scientific miracles of the Quran or the, you know, the so-called scientific miracles of the Quran. And, you know, I partly I just wanted to believe in it. And, and uh, you know, partly it, it that just really interested me, the whole thing about the scientific miracles and um, uh, miracles being in the Quran in that sense. And that really drew me towards the faith and back to the faith. And it's why I was such a strong believer and so into Islam. And I took it so seriously. It's because I believed that there was, there was evidence to prove that the, the Quran was true through these scientific miracles that couldn't have been there otherwise. Being a Salafi and being brought up as one, I was taught that uh, the whole thing about al wala wal bara the hatred for Allah and, and uh, um, enmity for Allah and love for Allah, believing that you hate the non-Muslims and you love the Muslims and that your love is um, limited only to Muslims. Um, and just, I believe that I, I, I was living in enemy territory, that Britain was at war with Islam. Um, uh, and I think for me, the way that in the midst of the Iraq and Afghanistan was um, the, the, the scholars at, and the imams at the mosque that I attended presented it all as a war against Islam. That the reason why they're there is just to kill Muslims. And I believe that because um, it's exactly, it kind of conformed to my Salafi mindset. And because of that, unfortunately, and this is something that I'm genuinely embarrassed to mention and, 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 and something that I feel really ashamed about, but at the same time, I feel needs talking about, um, is that at one point I was considering even, you know, carrying out a retaliatory in what I believe to be in, in retaliation for the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, a retaliatory attack in, in, in London. Um, but thankfully, I kind of managed to pull myself away from that way of thinking before I really did anything. It was just thoughts in my mind, but at the same time, the fact that I even reached that stage is kind of terrifying, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was always into science and whichever school I went to and I changed a few schools, I was always top of the class in science, right? F science fascinated me. Since I was a, a kid, I always wanted to know how things worked and how things happened. And I never lost that curiosity. Um, and one thing that had always been bothering me was that I believed in everything, I, I considered everything that science had come up with to be true, apart from the biological uh, theory of evolution. That was the one thing that I didn't believe in because I had been taught as per the Salafi kind of, the manhaj, the, the Salafi methodology, um, that evolution is untrue, that humans did not evolve, that Adam was created, Adam alayhi salam was created by Allah with his hands, um, with clay. Now, this is something that had been bothering me for a long time and it's something that I decided, you know, to kind of push to the back of my mind. And while these kind of doubts are kind of somewhat surfacing in my mind, um, there's another doubt that came up, which might seem a bit esoteric and a bit strange. Um, but I kind of thought to myself, because in Islam we believe in magic, right? It, there's the belief that black magic is true and that it exists. I just had a, a, a thought one day that just randomly popped up in my head. What if Muhammad was a magician? What if the miracles that he performed were just simple magic? Well, then it couldn't have been magic because, you know, uh, magicians at the time of the Prophet Muhammad would have disproved him. Okay, but what if he was such a powerful and such a, a good magician that he fooled every magician that existed at the time? That his, he was the most powerful magician of the time um, ever uh, in, 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 in humanity. Um, and I just kind of, I couldn't, I couldn't answer that doubt. There was, there was no response that I could come up with. I even asked, I went to my mom and I asked him this question. I went up to people and asked them this question and there was no response that could convince me. And that doubt just kind of festered for such a long time that eventually it kind of, it was there for like, what, five years? Um, and eventually, you know, I then decided when that doubt wouldn't dispel and wouldn't go away, 
I just decided to look into evolution because that was the other doubt, the other main doubt I had. When I looked into evolution, I, you know, listened to, you know, Richard Dawkins talking about evolution, um, looked at the, you know, the, the arguments for real evolution, against evolution, and I came to the undisputable kind of uh, conclusion that evolution was true. And that's when all the cards fell. And, you know, it, it, it kind of forced me to reevaluate my whole Salafi mindset and my, my views of Islam. And um, eventually I became a really progressive Muslim, accepted evolution. Um, and yeah, the doubts about Islam still kind of remained. And eventually, you know, when I realized that the scientific miracles of the Quran weren't true, that's when I, be when I left Islam completely. Um, and yeah, that's, that was my journey out of Islam. The way I kind of managed to reconcile evolution and Islam was because one of the Salafi Imams in my mosque went by the name of Osama Hassan. He, um, and he publicly came out while I was still a Salafi and said, said to his congregation, and, and you can find this video online, um, and said, I believe biological evolution is true. Adam evolved from apes. As soon as he said that, you know, everyone went nuts. Um, people threatened his life. He had to have police protection. Um, and because he's someone I looked up to so much, he went to Cambridge. He studied astrophysics. I was always into science as well and a bit of a nerd. I, I really looked up to him and, I, and, and he was always kind of like a role model there for me. And so when he came out and said evolution's true, even though I didn't want to believe it, a part of me kind of said, well, what if he's right? And eventually, when I then decided to look into evolution, I went to his blog, read up his kind of arguments for reconciling Islam and evolution. Um, and by this time, he'd kind of gone and set up the Quilliam Foundation with Majid Nawaz. Um, and I decided, you know, after reading his blog that I believed in evolution and that I, I, I was a Muslim and a progressive kind of liberal kind of Muslim, the way kind of Majid Nawaz and, and Osama Hassan were. Um, and that was, th that was the reason why I kind of managed to um, reconcile Islam with evolution. It's, I just kind of took the whole created with his hand as non-literally, um, as you know, Allah can do things in a myriad of ways and evolution was the way in which Adam was created. And that was, that was how I managed to reconcile Islam with evolution. But that reconciliation didn't, it, it, it initially for like a year it was there, I believed in it. But then when I kind of looked into the, you know, the so-called scientific miracles of the Quran, realized they weren't true that whole kind of reconciliation and the belief in Islam kind of fell apart. As soon as I accepted that evolution was true, the floodgates opened in the sense that I couldn't remain a Salafi because if I remained a Salafi, according to, the, to Salafi Islam, I would have been an apostate just for believing in, just for believing in evolution, that um, humans evolved from uh, lesser life forms or le rather than using lesser life forms or from the single common ancestor um, As soon as I That happened the floodgates opened. I started looking into Sufi Islam. I started looking into Progressive Islam. I started looking into all these other kind of different aspects of Islam that I'd always kind of stayed away from I started looking into philosophy. That was something that I was always taught to stay away from I started using reason rather than just simply revelation. I started kind of using reason and revelation together. Um, and that's when the whole kind of progressive Islam and believing that um, I could be a Muslim and, and still believe in kind of gay rights, women's rights and, and the whole lot kind of started for me. And for me, because I was always into Islam seriously, just believe, just re knowing that they were progressive Muslims wouldn't have convinced me. I looked into the the arguments for kind of progressive Islam. You know, the the, arg the main argument being that the Quran was revealed over a certain number of years, that each ayah, each verse was re um, revealed in response to a certain situation, 
and that therefore historicizing the Quran and looking at it within the socio-historical context made sense. And when I then kind of historicized the Quran, it was more kind of, oh, this verse was revealed, but it was for the time and kind of then looking at it, it kind of like that. Um, and that's where my whole kind of progressive Islam, progressive Muslim kind of mindset came from. I still had doubts about Islam. Um, and even though I was happy, this is the happiest I've, I was with Islam. And, um, you know, I, 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 these doubts had been dispelled as if they related to evolution, at least. Um, but then there was other stuff bothering me as well, like, are there really scientific miracles in the Qur'an? And when I kind of looked into the whole, the whole claim that there are miracles in the Qur'an, I realised that it had kind of, they didn't exist, that the whole kind of miracle in the Qur'an, it was all kind of bending and twisting the verses to kind of fit a particular kind of, you know, a very kind of, you couldn't an unbelievable interpretation um that 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 kind of just fitted and just kind of said oh this is a scientific miracle um started looking into the arabic of it and and whilst i don't speak arabic i i, I i'd learned a little bit um so i could kind of you know look in look into the arabic um and look up look look up the words in the dictionary and stuff and i realized that it it had all been twisted um Eventually, I start looking into debates with Muslims and atheists, and uh, I remember um, looking at this debate between Hamza Zortzis and Lawrence Krauss in UCL, and the one thing that um, that convinced me was when Hamza Zortzis was saying, well, of course, there has to be a creator, because everything that every cre creation has a creator, right? Creator. So it... it and then Lawrence Krauss just came up with, well, all you're doing is just thinking about what makes sense to you. You're not really looking at the evidence and looking at um, how, for instance, some things, when you, when you look at the evidence and look at the evidence alone, some things that might seem in, initially irrational turn out to be rational. They, they, they turn out to be true. For instance, quantum physics, which a lot of which kind of doesn't make sense to us started looking into the philosophy of it and and you know looking at looking at a causing b and you know a being the creator and b being the creation but you know um looking into the time causality of it and, and all that not that i want to go into it too much realizing that whilst we don't know for sure how the universe came about right we know from the big bang but what caused the big bang and multiverse theory and all that we couldn't be sure that it had to have been a creator. And in fact, it seemed like that the idea that there had to have been a God was so overly simplistic um, that it probably wasn't true. And that's when I became a really kind of agnostic deist. I still, deist being, I believed in God, right? Or I was agnostic, an agnostic deist. I thought that a God might exist. But the God that I might potentially believe in or that I might thought that potentially existed was a God that set up the beginning conditions of the Big Bang um, and after the Big Bang did not intervene. No revealed religion, no prayers, no miracles, nothing like that. Like as Dawkins put it, the God of the scientist. Um, and I became, this was me being an agnostic deist, eventually became agnostic and then eventually agnostic atheist. It was a very kind of slow transition and that was how I eventually left Islam. I feel like um, with me being gay there was always a part of me that was looking at all the fatawa the you know the the the, the, le the legal rulings by the scholars and and um, how they said that the way in which you should kind of cure your homosexuality firstly that there's no such thing as being homosexual that it's just a something that is a, a perversion of the fitrah, the, 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 the internal nature of someone, um, that um, it could be caused by possession. I believed I was possessed at one point um, by a jinn. Um, and, and it might have been that it could be a punishment for something that I'd done wrong. Um, and this was a punishment, a test 
um, from Allah or on me. Um, because even though I, I outwardly believed that I wasn't gay and that I could become straight if I tried hard enough and if I became religious enough, um, by the way, the whole kind of being gay and trying to become more religious to try to cure myself p played into my um, extremism and my becoming extreme because my becoming more religious, given that I was Salafi already, just kind of meant becoming more extreme. Um, and so perversely, in a sense, I became more extreme and became more, you know, jihadi kind of in my mindset and the way of thinking because I was gay. That, that, seem, that might seem bizarre, but that was the case. Um, but I think in the back of my mind, I, always, I kind of always knew that this was how I was, that I wouldn't be able to change no matter what I did. And I think that might have been what precipitated all the doubts about kind of, you know, Muhammad being a magician and, and looking into the whole biological evolution thing. I feel like maybe kind of subconsciously that was there. Um, although, you know, um, it wasn't the reason why I left Islam because when I was a progressive Muslim, which I believed in wholeheartedly at that time, I was, you know, my sexuality and my being gay and being Muslim was fine. I'd somehow managed to, rad like, no, um, sorry, reconcile it. Um, and I was, I was happy, but then eventually leaving Islam wasn't because I was gay. It was more to do with looking at the, you know, the, the so-called scientific miracles of the Quran. Although I feel like it had a kind of background role to play in the whole, the whole thing. It was, so I accepted my sexuality as soon as, not as soon as, but shortly after I became a progressive Muslim. I looked at kind of gay imams and kind of, I looked at this particular scholar of Islam who converted to Islam and happened to be gay, Scott Siraj al uh, Huck. Um, and um, I, I, look, I read his book. I kind of, I had to, I couldn't get the physical book because it was literally called homosexuality in Islam. Right. I couldn't have that around with my parents, you know, not knowing that I'm that I'm gay um, and especially them being Salafi. Right. Just imagine just an average kind of Muslim family realizing their son's gay. Right. And imagine the the the, the, the reaction that that would kind of come about if, um, you know, a Salafi family realized that their their son was gay. So I kind of I downloaded it on my Kindle um, and was reading it on my Kindle. And I, it convinced me as as an ex-Muslim now. I would kind of look at that and say, I don't find the arguments convincing, but at the same time as a Muslim, I did find the arguments convincing because I was kind of presented with this choice be between either believe that people are born gay and that they can't change it and believe that being gay is haram. I would have had to have believed that Allah was this, this guy who was, so messed up that he would create someone being gay and then would say, nope, it's haram and you, you can't be gay, right? And, you know, Muslims come out with the whole, well, it's, it's not the, the being gay that's haram, it's the act. I always respond with, well, imagine you got a hundred straight people, told them never to have sex in their lives, to be virgins for their whole lives. How many do you think would kind of conform to that, would never have sex in their lives? Like, it would have to be less than 10. Because, you know, the, the sexuality is such a fundamental part of our kind of identities that you can't kind of excise it without having some sort of, some sort of side effect. Um, and, you know, I, I, that was the reason why I kind of accepted the whole being gay and being progressive Muslim because I wanted to believe in an Islam and it, I wanted to believe in a God that was just. Um, but eventually, you know, I, I, when I left Islam, I'm not sure I would find those arguments convincing as an atheist, but as a Muslim, I did find them convincing, which is why I think maybe progression with gay rights and Islam might be possible for some Muslims. Um, even if I, I don't really believe in those arguments as an ex-Muslim now. I think a lot of gay, I mean, 
I feel like I would first have to discuss the kind of relationship that gay men and women would have. There would be the kind of gay person who believes that it's haram and then, but that they're gay and that they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, being sinful. There'd be gay people that believe it's haram and try to remain virgins. And then there would be gay people um, who believe that it's, uh, that actually Islam is okay with, with, with gay people. Um, I feel like in all of those instances, in all of those scenarios, I don't think you can have a fair relationship with Islam because, um, I mean, fundamentally, for those people that believe that it's still haram, I mean, a fundamental aspect of you is just kind of being declared as, 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 as haram, uh, a fundamental kind of, an instinct um, is being, as being kind of said that this is kind of messed up and that therefore, you know, as a sinner, you are someone who is messed up, right? It's, Muslims will say, you know, don't, don't, it's not, har it's haram, but the sinner, you leave them alone. Well, if there has to be some sort of a, if you're fundamentally like that, if fundamentally you want to commit sin, surely that means that there's something wrong with that person, right? If they fundamentally want to commit sin. Um, so I don't, I'm not entirely sure I buy the whole, you know, um, you know, you, you, you hate the sinner, but uh, you, you, you love the sinner, but hate the sin. Um, and at the same time, those Muslims that do believe that being gay is allowed in Islam, I feel like their own internal, uh, their sexuality is getting in the way of them looking at the evidence, uh, the, the Quranic evidence and the Hadith evidence from a completely... Uh, detached mindset and from a rational mindset so unfortunately even though I am a big proponent of progressive Muslims and I believe that I'm a big like supporter of gay Muslims personally if I'm being honest with you I don't think you can have a fair and equal relationship with Islam um, well I'm a pro so now imagine me being about what 20 and I'm a proper progressive Muslim who believes in you know women's rights and doesn't believe that you hate the kuffar. I'm so progressive at this stage that um, I believe non-Muslims can go to heaven as well if they're good people, right? Um, that's how progressive I am. And then out come kind of my parents kind of saying these things that are misogynistic and against the kuffar and against the white people. My parents were pretty racist against white people. Um, and I would get really angry. I'd get really annoyed and start having arguments with them. And this happened for a few months. Uh, I eventually told them that I was kind of like a, a mixture between a Sufi and a Salafi, that I'd, I'd become kind of this more progressive Muslim. And my dad didn't talk to me for like a whole week. That's how much it affected him. Just me telling them that I'd kind of was still a Muslim, but didn't believe in their form of Islam. Um, and eventually these arguments got to such a stage where... Um, now I've kind of left Islam, they don't know, they still think I'm this kind of progressive kind of Muslim and eventually during one of these arguments the anger boils out over and I just say, you know what, I'm not even sure if Allah exists, I'm not even sure if I'm a Muslim and immediately my parents said get the F out of the house. Um, so I immediately kind of went upstairs uh, packed whatever I could in my bag, looked up the cheapest hotel I could find and stayed there, went, left the house um, and stayed in this really cheap hotel overnight. Now, I didn't have a job or anything. Um, I couldn't really afford a hotel even, even though it was the cheapest one I could find. Eventually, I, the next day I go to my grandma's house. I don't tell her the complete truth. I don't tell her that I've properly left Islam. I just tell her that I'm having doubts and that they kicked me out because of it. My grandma calls my parents. Um, my parents kind of, you know, tell me to put, tell my grandma to put me on the phone. And my parents then said this. Now, I'll rewind a little bit. Um, sorry for jumping about. But a few weeks before all of this had happened, I had almost told my parents about me being gay. I said, Mom, Dad, there's something that I have to tell you. And chickened out at the last minute, right? Now, fast forward now, back, I'm at my grandma's, I'm on the phone to my parents, and my mom my, my says, 
You know that thing that you wanted to tell us? We know your secret now. We know what it is. Without them even having to say that I was gay, I knew immediately what they were referring to. A chill, I remember, just like exactly like it was yesterday, a chill went down my spine. Um, and my parents said, you have to come home. Um, we need to talk to you. And I agree. So I left my grandma's house, didn't tell her what had happened. Um, I left my grandma's house. And then kind of I think to myself, what if they actually kill me? Or what if they do something like send me to Pakistan or something like that? And so I kind of called them back and I said, you know what? I'm too afraid. I don't think I can come. Um, they convinced me to come. They said, we won't do anything. We promise we won't hurt you or anything like that. So I believe them. Um, I go home. My, um, my dad kind of takes me out to the garden because he doesn't want my, my siblings overhearing what we're about to talk about. Um, and... You know, he asked me a bunch of questions like, how long have you known you were like this? And um, he, he asked me, do you have a boyfriend? I told him the truth. I said, no. He said, have you ever done anything with a guy? I lied. I said, no. Right. Um, and he said a bunch of kind of like, you're disgusting and you're horrible and you're this and that. And he explained to me how he had found out that I was gay. What they'd done is they hadn't used, they hadn't looked at my history using my computer because my dad's good with computers. He used the Wi-Fi router to look at the internal kind of the 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 um, the history from the router itself, um, and I had realised that I'd also kind of been you know accessing gay porn sites, right? Um, and so that's how they found out I was gay. So they essentially found out that I was that I had left Islam, and I was gay on the same day. Um, so it was like a double a double whammy of sorts. Um, and eventually my dad said, um, after, you know, the whole kind of like a torrent of abuse and stuff, um, he kind of said, the only way I will agree to you staying in this house is if you agree to be exorcised, right? Exorcism as in Rukia, right? And I had nowhere to go, right? And so I reluctantly agreed. Immediately the next day, I go to my university, um, and I try to find a place for me to stay at I explain my situation um, and you know I, I find a place but it's only going to be available in a in two two three months time so you know I had to kind of stay in my parents house for two three months time kind of going through these exorcisms like making me lie down putting their hand on my forehead reciting the Quran making me bathe in kind of holy water with leaves in it and making me eat like honey that had been kind of you know made holy somehow uh, we even went to this place in kind of I think it was in Ilford um, and um, literally when we went there it was lit it was a shop and on the shop front on the name it literally said Rukia right this is publicly in the UK um, where it literally says in Arabic tran in, in transliteration it says Rukia um, that kind of shocked me but yeah kind of went through the exorcism with that guy as well. And he asked me, do you feel different? And I kind of said, no. Um, bizarrely, while the, the exorcism was going on, I felt like free, there was a part of me that wanted to freak out and scream. I still can't explain it to this day. It was just, I'd kind of seen videos of, of exorcisms and stuff before. I'd done an exorcism on someone once before as well. And I just felt this urge in order to kind of freak out. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't freak out or anything. I just kind of sat there with nothing happening. But I still can't fully explain that urge to this day. Um, but um, yeah, while these kind of exorcisms were going on, initially it was just annoying. But then my kind of emotional part of my brain kind of took over the rational part of my brain. And I kind of started thinking, well, what if I am possessed? I started becoming like super depressed and... Eventually, I'm becoming suicidal, and uh, this kind of culminates in in an attempt, right? In, in uh, I'm already suffering from like severe depression from having all the doubts about Islam and leaving Islam and the whole thing, um, and this kind of culminates in a suicide attempt. And my dad kind of caught me while I was trying to kind of I was gonna I don't want to uh, mention anything graphic or anything, but I was I was trying gonna hang myself using the wardrobe in my home in in my room. Um, 
And my dad kind of caught me and he said, you know, whatever you do, don't kill yourself. And after that, like two, three days later, I left. Um, I left home and I kind of moved to this place near my university and um, kind of went back home because my parents kind of made me made me kind of go. At one point uh, when I'm at home, it's it's kind of devolving into arguments about me being gay and about me being an ex-Muslim. And eventually at one point it kind of, you know, turns into like a physical confrontation and uh, the police were called. And after that, I've never been, never had any contact with my parents at all. Um, and that now it's been like, what, six, six years. Um, and yeah, that was my whole coming out and, and, and leaving Islam. And yeah, that was, that was it. I think that's a bit of a difficult question. I think if you're a very kind of progressive Muslim who accepts, um, you know, uh, progressive Islam, I think in some sense you can make Islam and science compatible. But um, given some of the stuff that's mentioned in the Quran, um, uh, the the kind of like inaccuracies, for instance, about where kind of semen comes from, from the rib cage and the back between the rib cage and the backbone. From a person who's looking at it from the outside, from a de hopefully a more detached perspective, I don't think that they are compatible. I don't think religion is compatible with science because science is goes beyond. Um, it's about accepting. Um, this, uh, the, when you're looking at the epistemology of things, when you're looking at the philosophy of how, where knowledge comes from, you're looking for evidence and fundamentally religion and revelation asks you to accept the, the Quran or the Bible or the Torah, whatever, um, on faith. And I think that fundamentally goes against the whole philosophy of science, um, so in a sense, it can be compatible if you accept evolution. And I think there is a movement now with Muslims to, uh, going forward about accepting evolution within the context of Islam. Some of them believe in evolution, but don't believe in human evolution, which I think is a, a contradiction. But some of them are also, also starting to believe in human evolution too. I think fundamentally they're incompatible, but in some senses with progressive Islam and with the movements towards accepting evolution, they can to a degree. Um, I'm not sure if that's a, uh, 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 a kind of like a, a resolute kind of answer that you were looking for, but um, yeah. In terms of my life being better, I was fundamentally, I almost say the, I'd say granted this ability to finally think for myself and to go where my my wherever my thoughts lead me without being afraid of, of of um of, of offending Allah, of of or of leaving Islam, um and I think that was the biggest positive that I, I could receive as someone who is, who's into science, who's into thinking for themselves and into reason, that was the most kind of. Fundamentally, kind of pleasing thing for me um for me for me to be able to think for myself finally in terms of things being negative as soon as I, I i kind of came out to everyone on facebook as both gay and as ex-muslim immediately or i was i was involved in the islamic society at my university and um immediately kind of like all my friends kind of left me all of them uh, pretty much all of them um, and given that most of my friends were Muslim, that 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 was the case. Um, my family, I lost my family. Uh, that resulted in, in in a significant degree of kind of like depression and um, anxiety. Um, and I've kind of been dealing with the effects of all of that since then. Um, but at the same time, I wouldn't change anything. I would I would still. I think fundamentally being open about who you are. And, and and what you believe in and what you don't believe in is such an important part of being a human of 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 questioning things and of 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 being curious of of questioning a uh, religion i think it's such a fundamental part of being a human that i wouldn't be able to see myself living any other way i wouldn't 
I wouldn't to anyone anyone uh, watching this who isn't in a position to be open about it. I wouldn't say be open about it. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that. But at the same time, personally for me, I would I I I I I, I wouldn't change anything. I I would still be, tell my parents and be open to everyone about it, regardless of the consequences, um, because it was just such a fundamental kind of right for me. Um, yeah, I've given thought to who Muhammad really was. I've given a lot of thought to it, and personally, I don't think I hate him. I don't think I hate him at all. I I, I understand that a lot of ex-Muslims do feel a lot of hatred towards uh, the 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 Prophet Muhammad. But personally, one, all the stuff that's attributed to him. You can't really be sure it's true because there's not. You can't really authenticate these uh, these hadith in the first place. But secondly, even if you know half of it was true, I feel like he suffered from some sort of a, a, a mental disorder like schizophrenia. So like for instance, it's narrated that when he had the revelations, he would he would be um, having seizures. That he'd 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 um, that all this kind of stuff happens and and it's. It kind of seems like a, I mean, I was looking into kind of schizophrenia and apparently like a significant proportion of people that are in hospital for schizophrenia, like something like 30, a third of them have like religious delusions. So religious delusions is a big part of, of, of psychosis, um, it seems, especially as part of schizophrenia or whatever other kind of psych, psych, psychotic condition. Um, and, you know, I kind of feel sorry for him um i you know yeah he was a warlord and and this whole stuff and the whole thing with with aisha and, i mean let's let's even say even half that stuff's true i mean given that he was brought up in a in a time where um you know tribes were just fighting against each other all the time i would kind of put a would all kind of place that in a context just looking at a human and saying if they were if, there were, if a human was brought up in a kind of a warring society, it kind of makes sense if that kind of that person grew up to also be warring as well and to, to, to be a warmonger. It's, I'm not defending him. I don't think what he did was right. I think it's wrong. And I categorically state that in terms of the whole, the, the jihad thing. And I really wish that that stuff hadn't happened. I think the world would be a better place if, um, you know, this stuff didn't happen and it didn't exist. But... At the same time, I'm kind of more sympathetic towards the guy and kind of feel sorry for him. Yeah. I'm not sure if a lot of ex-Muslims would agree with me on this one, but that's, that's, my, that's my view. Yeah. About jihad and Islam and believing in kind of like the, the whole violence and Islam, I think with progressive, this is where I kind of, I respect progressive Muslims a lot. I look up to them and I, I always kind of, to, to sometimes to the sh chagrin of my kind of ex-Muslim friends, I always kind of even promote progressive Islam to a degree and kind of defend progressive Muslims. But where I kind of disagree with progressive Muslims is where they kind of say, where I agree with them is where they say, I believe that jihad is nonviolent and that it's a struggle and that violent jihad was for past generations. I accept that that's their interpretation of it. I accept and I... I I'm glad that that is their interpretation of it, to be frank. Um, but at the same time, to then say blanketly that this is not Islam, that Islam is not violent, that violent jihad is not part of Islam, is just simply untrue. All they're saying is that my interpretation of it is true and that other people's interpretation is incorrect. To be frank, if you read the Quran literally, in terms of, of, of what it says about you know the whole... Uh, fighting the kuffar and and even even if you place that within the context of the time um it's emphasized to such a degree that enmity between non muslims and non-muslims that's emphasized to such a degree that it's it's it kind of makes sense and i'm just being honest it kind of makes sense when kind of jihadi muslims of a jihadi mindset come out with an say that they believe in jihad it, it 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 makes sense if you believe in the quran as being the literal word of allah it it it, it 
that interpretation makes sense because it, it goes with the literal uh, meaning of, 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 of the word. Um, about kind of the youngsters, uh, the young people becoming more kind of extreme, it's interesting to kind of look at the kind of like the waves of, and, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at Salafi Islam specifically, but I think there's a mistake that you can make, which is say that all violent Islam is Salafism and you ignore all the other kind of violent forms of Islam, like Deobandi Islam and, and, and the other forms of Islam. Um, there's a mistake, there, there's a mistake in, in doing that, but I think it is still, I think it's justified to focus on Salafism, at least in this context, because there were two waves of Salafization in, at least in the UK. My parents uh, were part of the first wave, like 2000, pre-2000, um, and they kind of converted to the Salafi form of Islam. It was a small wave. Um, the second wave that happened uh, was much larger, and a lot of people became Salafi in that wave, and to kind of, in my personal experience, when I was a kid in school, in primary school, I was pretty much the only Salafi around. I was kind of like looked down upon as being the Salafi guy, right? Um, but then when I kind of went to uh, college, Everyone around me was Salafi suddenly, right? I mean, Salafism had just grown to such a degree. Um, and it's, it's this kind of like this wave of Salafization that's kind of backed by petrodollars, by Saudi Arabia. Although it seems that they're kind of making some efforts to kind of counter that now. Not, don't know where that's going to go. Um, but the whole kind of jihad thing and the Islam thing and, and progressive Islam and progressive saying that it's got nothing to do with Islam... I cringe every single time when a progressive Islam Muslim says Islam is violent and then a, a, a person who's kind of like uh, an anti-Islam, justifiably, right, um, who then says, no, Islam is violent and that your Islam isn't true, right? It's, as an ex-Muslim, looking at the evidence, looking at the Quran and the Hadith, I would say Islam is definitely a warring kind of religion. But as someone who's been a progressive Muslim, who's genuinely believed in progressive Islam. I know for a fact, you know, that, that progressive Muslims aren't engaging in so-called, you know, taqiyya or whatever, um, that they genuinely do believe in it and that there are some interpretations that could be convincing to Muslims um, and that historicizing the Quran could be a solution in doing that, in putting it in its socio-historical context. Not that 99% of Muslims would agree with that, but that's possible. So I'm going to have to come up with an answer that's somewhere in between where I say personally as an ex-Muslim, I do think it's definitely v kind of violent. But at the same time, I respect progressive Muslims and I, I believe them when they say that, you know, they don't believe in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a violent Islam. And I definitely do think Islam could, pr could evolve and become something more progressive. I definitely think that's a possibility, um, but I don't think it's at that stage now. In terms of the emotions, leaving Islam is the hardest thing I've done in my life. And that's not an over-exaggeration. It felt like I was on a cliff edge and it's, it was pitch black. And I had the option of jumping off this cliff not knowing if there's ground underneath, uh, if, the, if there's another cliff that's going to catch me. And, or not knowing if it was just a void and I'd just kind of keep falling and I'd die, right? And I use this analogy because when, the reason why I didn't, op you know, I wasn't just kind of, I didn't leave Islam earlier is because I thought if I was open to my, my uh, doubts, if I looked into them, that I might come to the wrong conclusion, might leave Islam and end up in hell burning forever. So I, I had to take a risk. And that risk was running off this kind of, uh, jumping off this proverbial cliff, not knowing if, you know, I could trust my, re my, my, my reasoning faculties to bring me to the correct conclusion. Because, you know, I could have come to the wrong conclusion. I could have, you know, said Islam's not true, all the while Islam being true, and I'd burn in hell forever. So I had to risk essentially eternity in hell 
in order to question everything. And that was terrifying. I developed depression with the doubts uh, because I, I, I was having these doubts. I was trying to push them to the back of my mind. Um, I, I became clinically depressed. I was on, even had to take uh, medication for a while. Um, and it, it was the most terrifying, the most kind of emotionally tumultuous kind of event I've been through. Um, and I definitely understand the fear involved and the reason why so many Muslims just refuse to question Islam, just refuse to question. Because that it's the diff most difficult thing I've done, done in my life. And yeah, it, it wasn't easy. To a doubting Muslim, the first thing I would say is trust your reasoning f faculties. Trust yourself. Because if you can't trust your reasoning faculties, you can't trust anything. You can't trust anything you know about the world because everything you know about the world goes through the filter of your own kind of intellect, your own kind of awareness, your own uh, reasoning ability. If you don't have that, you have nothing. So trust your reasoning abilities. Wherever it takes you, whether you remain a Muslim or you don't remain a Muslim, I will support you. But as long as you, you know, do justice to those doubts that you have. Um, that's incredibly important um, and what I would say is you would have there's going to be a point where you're going to have to put your fear of hell to the side because if you don't deal with these doubts head-on you're gonna be going through emotional turmoil for the rest of your life because these doubts won't go away the only way to get rid of them is to deal with them and I, 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 my advice would be, if you're having doubts, don't be afraid to question. Yeah.